God can do whatever he wants, right? I mean, after all, we can't limit God, can we? Hmm, that's a question we definitely need to answer today. Good morning, this is your wake-up call. It's wake-up call 090, don't limit God. This is the Faith for My Generation podcast, and I'm your host, AJ. I'm so glad that you're here and that you're watching and listening. Let's get right to it. Let's go to Psalm 78. Psalm 78, we're going to look at a couple verses in Psalm 78, starting at verse 40. And I want us to think about this idea. Um, can God be limited? You know, of course, we've probably heard it. We've probably even said it. God can do anything. And we understand that God is powerful. Jehovah Almighty, the Almighty God, He is powerful. He can do anything and all things that He desires to do. In Him is all wisdom, all truth, all knowledge, all power, all might, all life. He is all in all. But the reality is, in Scripture, His Word, He has told us there are some things He will never do. For instance, Numbers 23 tells us that God cannot lie. He is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should repent. If he said it, he'll do it. So there's one thing we know that God cannot do. He cannot lie. The book of Hebrews tells us that God is faithful, and he cannot be unfaithful. 1 Thessalonians 5.24, he who has called you is faithful to do it. So there are, there's a second thing we see, that God cannot be unfaithful. We know that God created all things simply by speaking into existence. With the power of his creative word, he spoke, and it was so. So if God speaks, it is. So we know he can't go back on his word because his word carries creative power. The book of Ezekiel tells us that God will not judge the righteous with the unrighteous or vice versa. So we understand that God cannot judge the righteous, unrighteous, or the unrighteous righteously. They have to turn in repentance to the, to the Lord walk in His ways and His precepts, receive His life and His salvation. So really when we get down to it, we understand there are some things that God cannot do because He Himself has set bounds for what He will do. In fact, that's an interesting way for us to understand the truth of God's Word is that God has created boundaries. He has created law. You know, the Bible is specifically called that the law of God. The Bible is the law of God. And so we know His Word is His law. It's His covenant. And so God, if He says something, He's not going to go back on His Word. Now, with this idea of limiting God, where do we even get that phrase from? That's where we go to Psalm 78, verse 40 and 41. Psalm 78, verse 40 and 41 says this, How often they provoked Him in the wilderness, rebelled against God. That's verse 40. And grieved him in the desert. Verse 41. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. Let me read that one more time. Psalm 78, 40 and 41. How often they provoked him in the wilderness and grieved him in the desert. Yes, again and again, they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. You know, I just did a, did a broadcast on the church YouTube channel and Facebook and personal TikTok and all that uh, entitled, Do Not Grieve the Holy Spirit. If you didn't get a chance to watch it live, don't worry. It'll drop on a Thursday teaching episode on the Faith for My Generation podcast very soon. Those replays of those live streams generally are the Thursday episodes here on the podcast channel. And it's good teaching. It was good for me uh, to study it out myself. But the Bible explicit, excuse me, explicitly says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit. That's Ephesians 4.30. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit. What does it mean to grieve the Holy Spirit? It means to bring sorrow to God, to make Him sad. Uh, Genesis 6.6 tells us that when God looked out on creation, it had become so consumed in sin that Every imagination of mankind was continually and consistently evil. They were imagining up new ways to be evil and wicked in, in what they were doing. And of course, judgment came upon the earth and the salvation of God came on one household. Noah, his wife, his three sons and three daughter-in-laws, and they were to replenish the earth. But God was sorrowful. 
And in this sense, we see because of the unbelief of this particular people that God's talking about here in the chapter 78 of the book of Psalms, it brought grief to him. It brought grief to him. It provoked him. They provoked him in rebellion. In verse 41, yes, again and again they tempted God and limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. They limited the Holy One of Israel. Let's go to Numbers chapter 14. Numbers 14. There's many instances in the book of Numbers that we can see where the people of Israel, they come out of Egyptian slavery. They come out of bondage. Miraculously so. Of course, Moses is sent as a deliverer in Exodus chapter 3. He's commissioned, he's called, and he's sent to Egypt to deliver the people of Israel out of Egyptian bondage. They've been in slavery for about 400-odd years or so, and the cries of the people have risen up to the Lord, and his word is to be fulfilled and come about, which he spoke to Joseph. He also spoke to Abraham that those people of Israel, they would come up out of bondage and back to the promised land. Moses was the man that was selected to do that. God calls him in front of that burning bush where he's standing on holy ground and calls him, sends him to Egypt to stand before Pharaoh and tell Pharaoh, let my people go. Well, of course, if you don't know the story, go read it out. Go read it. It's a powerful story. The book of Exodus, um, the, up till about, what is it, chapters 3 through 12 is going to be when the Israelites are there in Egypt, all those 10 plagues that come through Egypt, and then they are eventually freed and they begin their pilgrimage to the promised land. Well, from that point forward, they begin to tempt and test God. There's many times, in fact, it, it tells us 10 different times, 10 different times that they tested God by unbelief, doubting his word, murmuring against God, and murmuring against Moses and Aaron. They're, they're, in Numbers 15 and 16, there's this show-off between these uh, rebellious men. Let's see if I can see the name real quick. It is Korah, number 16, Korah and Dathan and Abiram. They all stand up out of the tribe of Reuben. They say, who said that only God's going to speak to Moses and Aaron? We too can do it. But God had not set apart the tribe of Reuben to serve in the the tabernacle temple and eventually the temple. And they're they're saying, well, no, you know, it doesn't matter who God called. We can speak just as good enough as they can on God's behalf. And then, of course, they're swallowed up in the earth. And then Aaron's rod buds forth almond uh, blossoms and ripe almonds in one night. This stick, his rod, his stick, is set, uh, put in the tabernacle along with the other rods from uh, the other 12 tribes. And his blossoms, that's miraculous. Has blooms, that's miraculous. Ripe alm- almonds, that's miraculous. There's no roots. It's not a tree. It's a stick. And it shows that God had selected him to use him to be a mouthpiece for his behalf, for for what he desired to do in Israel. But Israel, these people, this generation, and I just, we just released that episode. It was a live teaching uh, entitled, It Only Takes One Generation. If you missed it, go check it out on the Faith for My Generation podcast. What you're listening to right now, scroll back one episode and you'll see it. It only takes one generation. And I made the point very simple using our foundational verse for the Faith for My Generation podcast, which is Judges 2.10, and I'll read it. I I don't think it'll be worth reading for you to hear it right now. Judges chapter 2, verse 10. This is the theme verse for this ministry, Faith for My Generation podcast. Verse 10 says this, When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. Now that's referring to the generation of believers that came after this generation that doubted God. Now in this generation that came out of Egypt, these men and women, they chose to test God, to tempt God, to doubt Him consistently again and again and again, murmur against Him, war against God's chosen man Moses, 
And out of that whole generation, only Joshua and Caleb, which we'll see, they had a different spirit. They had a spirit of faith. It was those two men that inherited the promise, but the rest did not. So let's look at Numbers 13. So Numbers 13, we've looked at this before on the podcast. If you've never read Numbers 13 and 14, it's a great section of the Bible to read to understand what faith looks like. What does faith really look like? Numbers 13, Numbers 14 will show you a great example of what faith looks like. Numbers 13 verse 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, Send men to spy out the land of Canaan, which I'm giving to the children of Israel. From each tribe of their fathers, you shall send a man, every one a leader among them. So Moses sends out these 12 men. Of those 12 men, he gives us the names of all those men. The two we remember are Joshua and Caleb because they were the faithful, just like you and me. Those that are listening, watching, if you don't know that already, if you're new to the podcast, we call ourselves the faithful because that's our desire. That's what we want to be is faithful unto God. So they search out this land for 40 days. And when they return, they come back carrying figs and pomegranates and clusters of grapes so large, these clusters of grapes so large that they had to put a rod through it, a staff through it, and one man carried it on his shoulder and another, and then rot, you know, grapes in, the, in between bouncing along back to the people of Israel that were waiting to hear the report of this promised land. What is this land that God is giving us? We've heard some good things about it. What does it actually look like? Verse 27 of Numbers 13, Then they told him, this is the twelve spies speaking to Moses, and said, We went to the land where you sent us. It truly flows with milk and honey, and this is its fruit. Nevertheless, the people who dwell in the land are strong. The cities are fortified and very large. Moreover, we see the descendants of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell in the land of the south. Hittites, the Jebusites, and the Amorites dwell in the mountains. And the Canaanites dwell by the sea along the banks of the Jordan. Then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, Let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, We are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report. The King James says an evil report of the land which they had spied out, saying, The land which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. And all people whom we saw in it are men of great stature, giants. Verse 33, There we saw the giants, the descendants of Anak, came from the giants, and we were, notice this, like grasshoppers, in our own sight, and so we were in their sight. So these 10 spies, there's 12, Joshua and Caleb, they have a different report. They have the report of the Lord. To these 10 other spies, they say, look, it is flowing with milk and honey. Notice, if it's flowing with milk and honey, that means there's cattle, because that's where milk comes from. If it's flowing with honey, that means there's bees. If you have bees, there must be trees. If it's flowing with milk, there's cows. If there's cows, there has to be pastures and there has to be rivers. So it's a beautiful, wonderful country, promised land that God is giving the people of Israel if they will but believe and take it. If they'll but believe and take it. But these ten spies say, look, it is as beautiful and wonderful as they say it is. But here's the thing. There's huge walls. Cities are fortified. There's giants. And there's a bunch of other nations and enemies that live in the mountains. And we can't do it. We can't take it. See, Caleb tells them, verse 30, he says, All right, everybody settle down. Settle down. Let us go up at once and take possession, for we're well able to overcome it. Caleb's saying, look, we can do this. God has promised us this land. If God says it's ours, then it's ours for the taking. Let's quit talking about the giants, the fortified cities, and the other enemies that want to take us out. Forget all that. If God said we can do it, we can do it. If God be for us, then who can be against us? Let's go take the land. But these other ten men began to give an evil report, and they point blank say in verse 31, 
We are not able to go up against the people, for they're stronger than we. God said they could. These ten men said we can't. God says yes. These ten men say no. So what happens? From these ten men, not a majority, there's probably two to three million people in the nation of Israel at this point when they leave Egypt. We know at one point in time it says there's 600,000 men of war. So probably about three million people, give or take. But ten men turn a nation. Let me tell you this. If you think that your voice isn't important, keep this in mind. Ten men turned the hearts of a nation. Ten. Not 10,000. Not a third. Not a half. 50%. Ten. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Now, if you want to get to three million, you're going to have to count a little bit longer. That would make this a very long episode. Ten men swayed a nation. Now, they did it negatively, destructively, and they did not reap the promise of God because of their unbelief. But notice the power there and the report that's given and then the power of a voice. The voice you have yielded to God and powered by the Holy Spirit, it can shake a nation. If it did it for the negative, I believe it can do it for the positive. And we know it does because Joshua and Caleb, they outlive this generation that because of their unbelief, they're struck dead. They're brought to their end. Now, it takes some time, about 40 years, but they, they ended their life. These unbelieving, murmuring people who had seen time and time again the power of God in the plagues of Egypt, the provision of God with manna and quail. At this point, they've already been being fed in the wilderness miraculously by manna, which is bread from heaven. It, manna literally means, what is it? It was sweet bread. And then quail that was blown in by the wind. You know, here, uh, I live in South Carolina. Several of y'all that are part of the faithful family, you know, we go to church together. But there's many of you that are listening. You live in different parts of the area, of the state or the country. And then there's, of course, listeners from other countries. Shout out to Canada and Germany, the top two other English-speaking. Well, Germany wouldn't be natively English-speaking, but the top two other nations that are watching and listening. Mexico's in there as well. Thank, thankful for everyone that watches and listens, listens to the Faith for My Generation podcast. But here... Where I'm at specifically, dove season is going on right now. Dove season's going on. So, so folks that go hunt and uh, you know hunting dove today, and uh, just talking to a friend that was getting ready to go to a dove hunt later this afternoon. Okay, they're looking for the birds. <laughs> they're planting pastures with millet and wheat and sunflowers. They're tilling up dirt so those dove, because that's where dove want to be, where there's those grain type crops where there's seed on the ground and where dirt's turned up so they can root around through it. They're trying to get the doves to come to them so that they can hunt them <laughs> and then have a cookout afterwards. Numbers 11, these Israelites, they're not hunting for the quail. God supernaturally blows wind and the birds come into the camp and they just go out and pick up the birds. They just come out and pick up the birds that God sends in. They're, they're being fed by the hand of God. But when they see a giant, when they see a strong city, when they see some other enemies, they think, we can't do what God said. Yet they have seen the power of God time and time again. So what happens? Numbers 14, verse 1. So all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. If you keep reading, and I would encourage you to do so, they say, you know, why did Moses bring us out here just for us to die? We're just going to die in the wilderness. Why are we even out here? We should have just stayed in Egypt. Joshua tries to change their heart. Verse 6, But Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Japunath, who were among those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the children of Israel, saying, The land we passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, then he will bring us into the land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel 
against the Lord, nor fear the people of the land, for they are our bread. Their protection has departed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. Joshua and Caleb are basically saying, look, (laughs) these guys, they're going to be our lunch. If we'll just obey God and refuse to rebel, we'll eat them up for breakfast. And what do the people of Israel do? They gather stones to kill Joshua and Caleb. <laughs> Talk about trying to encourage some people. They're just trying to, enc- they're trying to encourage this nation, which is really their family, and your cousins and cousins and cousins, but their, their nation, their people, stir them up to have faith in God. And what do they do? Hey, you know what? Let's kill these guys. <laughs> so <laughs> let that be an encouragement. Let that encourage you. When you feel kind of down because someone doesn't receive the, the love and truth that you share, at least they're not going to try to kill you. <laughs> if they just make fun of you, if they just post something on social media mocking you, you know, you're doing a live and there's people in the comment section mocking you, you know what? <laughs> Who cares? At least they're not picking up stones trying to kill me, right? And that's what they did with Joshua and Caleb. Now notice this, verse 20, Then the Lord said, I've pardoned according to your word. Moses begins to pray, intercede. Lord, pardon the iniquity of this nation. Verse 21, But truly as I live, all the earth shall be filled with the glory of the Lord. Verse 22, Because of all these men who have seen my glory and the signs which I did in Egypt and in the wilderness and have put me to the test, now these ten times, and have not heeded or listened to my voice, they certainly shall not see the land of which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of those who rejected me see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit, in him has followed me fully. I will bring I will bring into the land where he went, and his descendants shall inherit it. Now think about it. We opened up this episode, don't limit God. And then we asked the question, is that even possible to limit God? And then Psalm 78, 41 told us that the people of Israel limited God, the Holy One of Israel. So can you limit God? Yes. Say it louder for the people in the back. Can you limit God? Yes, absolutely. You can limit God. God and what He desires to do in your life by unbelief, by doubt, by fear to walk out in faith what God has promised, by ignorance. That's really the four ways that Satan wars. He wants to stir up unbelief or doubt. He wants to stir up fear or he wants to keep you ignorant. And that limited God. And so God's saying, these men, they've seen my glory. They're responsible. Think about that. That's that's heavy. That's powerful. These men, they have seen my glory. They've seen what I did in Egypt. They've seen what I've done in the wilderness. In other words, these men are not ignorant men. They've seen my power. They know what I can do. Yet, these ten times, and it's referring to Nine other events plus this one of how they have tested God and they've not obeyed His voice. And He's saying they're not going to enter in the promised land. Look, here's the reality. God is merciful. God is kind. He is loving, but He's also just. He's also holy. He is righteous. And there are times, and only God knows that. I'm not not going to pretend to say I know when it is. But it's, it's apparent from Scripture here and many other places. There are times where God says, that's it. No more. And He, in a, as a righteous judge, He knows that like, yeah, that they've, they've went too far. They have went too far. And these men, they, they went too far. And God's saying, they're not seeing the promised land. So what happens? For 40 years, They circle around and around and around and around in the wilderness until every one of these unbelieving, doubt-filled mockers of God, which no one can mock God, Galatians 6, 7, but they attempted to. Yeah, God said it, but we can't do it until they died. And the only two from this generation that see the promised land are the two that have a different spirit. 
Joshua and Caleb. They actually believed God. You go into the book of Joshua, Caleb gets his mountain. He says, I'm 85 years old, give me my mountain. I can, I'm just as spry and ready to go as I was 40 years ago, Joshua. Let me at those giants. And he does, boy. He goes in and he takes his mountain. Now that's in the that's in the Old Testament. Look at this. Mark chapter five or Mark chapter six. How important is faith to God? It's how we receive from God. You cannot receive anything from God without faith. You must have faith. In fact, before I read Mark six, let's Hebrews eleven, verse six. Listen to this. Hebrews eleven, verse six. If you haven't memorized this verse, this would be an excellent verse to keep to commit to memory. Hebrews 11, verse 6, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. You know, right there, foundational level, you have to actually believe in God. You, ha- you must believe he exists that He is who He says He is through the revelation of His Word, that He means what He says. You have to believe that He is. For he who comes to God must believe that He is, and second part, that He is a rewarder of those who diligently seek Him. God is a rewarder. You should say this wherever you're listening from right now. Say, God is a rewarder. And then say this, God is my rewarder because we're the faithful we're putting our faith and our trust in the lord jesus christ we're being obedient because that's what faith looks like obedience to the command and instruction of god's word and the voice of the holy spirit that's what faith looks like james chapter 2 tells us that faith without works is dead but we have a living faith and god's our rewarder because we're actually saying you know what lord you said it i believe it that settles it now notice this mark chapter 6 verse 1 Then Jesus went out from there and came to his own country, and his disciples followed him. And when the Sabbath had come, he began to teach in the synagogue. And many hearing him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? And what wisdom is this which is given to him that such mighty works are performed by his hands? Is this not the carpenter, the son of Mary, and the brother of James, and Joseph, Judas, and Simon? And are not his sisters here with us? So they were offended at him. But Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor except in his own country, among his own relatives, and in his own house. Verse 5. Now Jesus could do no mighty works there, except he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. Verse 6, and Jesus marveled because of their unbelief. Then he went about the villages in a circuit teaching. So notice Jesus, he comes to his own country. He comes on home, Nazareth. He's ministering. He, people have heard of some miracles. Some miracles have taken place. They're astonished, saying, Where does he get all this information from? Where does he get this knowledge and wisdom from? How can he do these mighty things? Isn't this Joseph's boy? Which, of course, he was. Jesus was born of a virgin. His father is the father in heaven. But Joseph, being a good man, took care and raised Jesus. And they're saying, isn't that Joseph's boy? Don't We know his brothers, James, Joseph, Judas, Simon. Jesus had half-sisters. Joseph and Mary had more children or had children after Jesus was born. They came together as any husband and wife would and had children. They had three, it looks like there, or four other boys and some and some girls. His sisters are here with us. We know this Jesus. Hey, he can't be the he's saying he's the Messiah, the Son of God. Oh, come on. We know him. We've we've seen him grow up. Yeah. Nah, we, we ain't gonna believe this. I can nah. Get out of here. And what did Jesus, what happens? Verse 5, he couldn't do any mighty works. There were apparently just a few people that believed and he laid hands on them and they received healing. And he marveled at their unbelief. This unbelief in him and who he was limited what he would do 
in that city. He could, it says it. Verse 5, now he could do no mighty work there, except he lay his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. The unbelief limited the ministry of Jesus in his own home city. Can you limit God? Yes. Unbelief will do it every time. Now, what's the cure? I'm just going to throw this in, a bon in, in for bonus. What is the cure for unbelief? Teaching. Teaching the Word of God. What did Jesus respond? His response, verse 6, He marveled because of their unbelief. Then He went about the villages in a circuit, teaching. When, you, when the Word of God is taught under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, when the Word of God is taught and it's preached and it's published and, it, and we speak it and we share it and we study it and we teach it and we're constantly going back and forth with one another, believer with believer, speaking the Word of God, building each other up, it builds up our faith. Well, how do we know that? Well, Romans chapter 4. Not 4, 10. Chapter 10, verse 17. So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. So Jesus, He's confronted with unbelief. It limits what He can do. Okay, let's teach. We're going to teach the Word. We're going to publish the Word of God. Jesus is the Word. So He's going to continue to minister and to teach and build up faith. Then people will receive. Now, what does God want to do in your life? Because here's the reality. Scripturally, we have very quickly, and we could keep going on and on and on, but scripturally we have used a witness from the Old Testament and a witness of Scripture from the New Testament. And we have established and we have seen the fact that God can be limited because God has set up this system. God has chosen how He will operate and work and labor with mankind. God has made the rules and the rules according to God is no faith, no flow of power. No faith, no promise. The Bible tells us, 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. In fact, let me read it before we finish here. 2 Corinthians 1, verse 20. For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him, amen, to the glory of God through us. The promises of God are yes and amen in Him. How are we going to receive what's in Him? Through faith. So faith is the conduit. It's the pipeline that God moves through. No faith, no flow. I like that. I just came up with that. No faith, no flow. Faith is the pipe that the power of God flows through, that the promises of God are brought about in our life. No faith, no flow. That's how God is limited in our lives because He has set up the rules it's his, it's his world. It, it's, it's how he operates, and he has established that. So let us conform to his truth. Now, we don't want to limit God. The last thing we want to do as the faithful is limit God. Because what does God desire to do in our life? We end it here. Ephesians 3, verse 20 and 21. Now to him who is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church, by Christ Jesus, to all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Verse 20, God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. The power of God that is manifested in our life, it begins with salvation. The same power that raised Christ from the dead is the same exact power, not a lesser power. It's not a wish.com version of power. <laughs> it's not the cheap version of power. The same power that raised Christ from the dead makes you and me alive when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And what does He want to do in our life? Not just what we ask or think, but exceedingly, abundantly above what we ask or think. Everything that God wills for us and wants to do in our life, when we bring our petitions before Him, He says, yep, this is where you're at, and I want to get you up here. Don't limit God. Whatever you do, do not limit God through fear, ignorance, 
unbelief or doubt. You know what? Before we finish this episode, let's pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for each and every single person that's watching and that's listening. Lord, our desire is this. We want to grow in you, Lord. We don't want to limit you, Father. We want your power, your promises, your provision, your will to be manifested in our life, Lord. If there be anything in us that hinders what you want to do in us and through us, Lord, reveal it. Prune it away. Cut it away. We don't want any part with that anymore, Lord, because we desire you and you alone. In Jesus' name, amen. Hey, I'm so thankful for you. Make sure that if you're watching on the YouTube channel, please subscribe. And of course, if you're not following the podcast, hit that follow button on Apple, Spotify. Uh, we got, I think, about 80 some odd folks that follow us on Spotify. I'd love to break 100 before the end of this year. That I ha- That's a goal that I've set. So if you're li- listening on Spotify and you've yet to actually follow the podcast channel on Spotify, hey, just hit that follow button for me. Uh, that way you get notifications when we drop new episodes as well. I'm thankful for each and every one of you. Make sure that you stay full of faith and let God be unlimited in your life. I know that you will because we are the faithful. I'll see you next time. God bless you.